Uh, my name is Mike Unger. I am president of Engineers for a Sustainable Future. And as the name implies, we're working on sustainability and especially climate change, which we view as the existential issue of the 21st century. We have as our speaker today, Jack Kerfoot. And Jack is a scientist and has given about 70 talks uh, to radio and TV stations across the country. And Jack is going to speak to us today on energy in Oregon. Jack, take it away. The topic really is discussing in Oregon the energy, the past, the historical look back, our potential, our renewable resource potential, which is sometimes ignored by people. They just assume that the renewable resources in every state are the same, and they're not. Barriers to the development of those resources in Oregon and the path forward to remove those barriers. If we do a look back, this slide actually shows the Oregon historical electricity consumption by fuel type. The unit or metric is trillion British thermal units starting in 1960 going up to 2018. The first we'll notice the first bar is yellow is hydro. We know Oregon has significant and has had significant hydro for quite some time. And what we can effectively see is in the 1960s and 1970s, 100% of Oregon's renewable en energy was renewable from hydro. And then we started to see the demands ramp up and we see the introduction of, of nuclear power in the 80s and the 90s. And then we start to see the development of coal, the dark blue. And then we start to see natural gas ramp up. And then slowly we start to see around 2005, the development of other renewable energy, such as wind and solar. But what we're actually also seeing is a dramatic ramp up in natural gas. And that's why our greenhouse gas emissions have gone from almost virtually nothing from the utilities in the 1960s and 1970s to a significant amount today. The next slide is from the Oregon Department of Energy. And it actually shows, as far as renewable energy, high small solar biomass geothermal and biogenic gas. And again, in 2018, we had coal, which is 25%, natural gas, 22%, and then petroleum. And then finally, nuclear at just at 4%. Thinking back to 1960, when it was 100% renewable, we've fallen dramatically as far as reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Let's talk about our potential. And let's start with wind. The undeveloped wind potential in the state of Oregon is approximately 27 gigawatts or 27,000 megawatts, which says it could meet over 200% of our energy demands in 2018. This is from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which is a subset of the Department of Energy. Offshore, the dark blue area right over here off of uh, Oregon and Northern California, has the potential to generate over 225 megawatts. This is the strongest and most consistent winds in the entire United States. So it could generate almost 2,000% 2, 2, of our power just from our offshore wind. Solar, we also have significant solar. These are two radiant heat maps that shows what the radiant heat potential is. The red or orange is the higher potential. The red is the darkest potential in the winter and in the summer. And what we see is the undeveloped solar potential is over almost eight gigawatts, which would meet about 14% of our power potential. Now, this is again from the Renewable Energy Laboratory, but this is dated in 2008. And the actual capacity for solar panels today or is it significantly higher than it was before. So this is a very conservative number. The third item is geothermal potential. And again, undeveloped geothermal potential is 2.2 gigawatts. And we have to realize the geothermal potential has been used in the United States since the 1960s. Northern California, north of Santa Rosa, California, near a town called Cloverdale, is the Geysers Geothermal Project, the largest in the world. And in the 1970s, it was generating over 80% of the Bay Area's entire electrical capacity. It could generate at least 29, potentially 30% of our geothermal capacity based on DOE data, 
If I look at USGS, United States Geological Survey, I get a much higher number. So in each case, I've tried to be very conservative in our assessment of geothermal potential and all renewable energy resources. So let's just take a look at what we would call a fairway map of the different resources we have. The first is hydro. Where are the major hydro projects that we have today? We see in the northern part of the state, the western part of the state, the solar fairway is superimposed in the yellow, followed by the onshore wind in the blue. We see the dashed lines that are there, followed by geothermal, and followed by offshore wind. What that tells us is over 2,200, almost 2,300 percent of renewable energy could generate uh, enough power to meet our electricity needs of 2018. So well in excess of the power demands today and in the future, and we could be exporting this power to other states. Okay, we have vast renewable energy resources, but who would buy this excess power and how are we gonna get it there? This actually shows the major intertie transmission lines, alternating current and direct current lines that were in, installed and developed in the 1970s. 3,100 megawatts, direct current and 4,800 megawatts AC, all going down from the northern part of uh, Oregon and the Washington border all the way down to Southern California. Now, why is California interested in power from the north? Well, first of all, the largest populated state in the US, about 39 million people, the second largest state in energy consumption in the US. They've also said they want to have all their new cars starting in 2035 be electric or certainly non-emission generating uh, vehicles, all trucks by 2045, and to be 100% renewable energy for their power grid by 2045. Now, the electric vehicles and trucks are important to factor into this equation because an electric vehicle consumes about 65 to 70% as much power as an individual home. Well, if we actually look at in September of 2020, 36% of the state's power was renewable. So California is going to need significant help to meet its green energy goals, as well as our national green energy goal of being carbon neutral under President Biden by 2050. Now, <clears throat> renewable energy potential, we have to recognize this isn't something that's un unexpected or hasn't happened before. In 1890, coal passed wood as the most used fuel. And so states like West Virginia and Kentucky became energy hubs for coal. In the 1950s, oil passed coal as the most used fuel because of the automobile. So states like Oklahoma and Texas became energy hubs. 2020, renewable energy passed coal in the electric power generation. So new renewable energy hubs are being developed in America now. We have the potential in Oregon and Pacific Northwest to be an energy hub. Wind, offshore wind, onshore wind, hydro, solar, geothermal, almost 2,300% of our power demand, so easily an exporter of clean, green energy. We have major power transmission lines in place, although they will need to be upgraded. And an opportunity to create over 33,000 new high paying renewable energy jobs. And these are just jobs operating and maintaining the wind farms, the solar parks and geothermal projects within the state of Oregon. Those are 33,000 permanent jobs. Unlike fossil fuels, coal, oil and natural gas, they don't go away when the resource is gone. As long as the wind blows and the sun shines, those jobs stay and they're permanent jobs. Now, construction wise, we're talking about over 1 million construction jobs in the state of Oregon. And these are numbers tied back to statistics from the Department of Energy, looking at a typical number of people to operate wind farms, and solar parks, and geothermal projects. What are the barriers? Well, to understand the barriers uh, in Oregon, let's take a look at operations in the United States. In the middle of COVID, between June 2020 and May of 2021, this map actually shows the number of utility scale energy projects that will be coming online. Green is wind, yellow is solar. We also have natural gas. Uh, and what we actually see is the dominant activity for new projects that are coming on in the middle of the COVID pandemic are the Texas, Oklahoma, and Iowa, 
We looked out in Florida and North Carolina, some in California, but very, very few in the state of Oregon. Even though we are rich in resources, they are not being developed compared to other states. Now, although these projects will not be developed and online in May of 2021, there is major uh, operational and development uh, activity right now for offshore wind farms from Maine all the way down to North Carolina. And these will be coming on in 2023 through 2025. We have to recognize that Europe has been using offshore wind for over 25 years. And the US is now slowly starting to develop our massive offshore wind energy off the coast, the Northeast coast of the United States. Those resources are equal to, if not greater, off the coast of Oregon and California. Now let's take a look at Oregon's power grid. And to understand that, this map actually shows the green area is an outline of the Bonneville Power Authority, which is a government federal organization founded in the 1930s as part of the WPA. Uh, and it covers an area of 300,000 square miles. So Oregon, Washington, Montana, Idaho, parts of Wyoming, Nevada, Utah, and Northern California. By comparison, that's an area that's even greater than the state of Texas, which is about 250,000 square miles. Operating 31 federal hydro projects and in the 1930s and the 1940s, that really was how it started with the development of new hydro for power in the Pacific Northwest and to create jobs during the depression. They also operate nuclear, coal, and natural gas plants. They operate 75% of the high voltage transmission lines. And that's very important to understand because all the new wind farms and solar parks that are developed that have to tie into the grid. And that's a critical component. Now, 15,000 miles of high voltage line sounds like a lot. But ERCOT, the, the power grid in the state of Texas, actually has 45,000 miles. So an area coming larger than the state of Texas, but yes, we only have a third of the high power transmission lines. And they were also developed for hydro, which is understandable since it was first uh, formed in 1937. BPA generates anywhere from 28 to 40 percent of Oregon's power. Then we have the private utilities, Pacific uh, Portland Gas and Electric, Pacific Corp, and Idaho Power. Rarely, they rarely develop high voltage transmission lines because of the economics. Really, to develop a high power transmission line, you need multiple projects to bring them on stream. And for the economic reasons, and also the difficulty of permitting in the state of Oregon, they have been slow to do this. So sparse grid coverage over a renewable, uh, where the renewable energy is. And if we recall, the renewable energy for onshore wind and for solar and for geothermal was in the eastern part of the state. And that's really not where our grid is. And then of course, offshore, we have nothing at all in place today. So let's take a look at our barriers. And why isn't our renewable energy being developed? Transmission line system is designed for hydropower. Permitting and cycle time plus site and transmission lines. By comparison, if we look at Texas, it's 12 to 18 months. And that's one reason we saw all the activity in states like Texas and Oklahoma and New Mexico, but also states like Florida and North Carolina. New Jersey is two to three years for offshore. Now that is significant because the governor of New Jersey, Governor Murphy came in and looked at ways to streamline the permitting processes and said, we don't need to sequentially go through these multiple types of permits. We can do the many of these permits in parallel and if they all come back green, then we can give them approval. So they have shortened it down from five to seven years to two to three years, which is why of all the states along the East Coast, New Jersey will be the operating port for future operations for the wind farms, the supply, of maintenance for the offshore wind turbines, upgrade of these turbines will be based in New Jersey because the innovative progressive development of the state of New Jersey. Oregon, by co contrast, it's taking six to 20 years. Uh, I've heard examples from the land department uh, representatives at uh, Portland General Electric saying it took 20 years to lay just a 17 mile, mile uh, power line into the grid in an area that was sparsely populated 
There were no environmental issues whatsoever relative to the land or the soil, the animal, the wildlife. But uh, issue, there are issues in our state relative to development of anything relative to uh, power projects. The next uh, is Oregon uh, access, the BPA land permitting uh, permits and processes. They have their own processes. And so the shortest time we can look at getting approval to tie in is typically five to six years. Of course, we have county restrictions in Oregon. Some of these restrictions actually oppose you, uh, the development of solar. And these are in areas that are agricultural areas and their thoughts are, we need to put a priority for agriculture, for farming, and we need to restrict it from solar. But yet in the studies by the agricultural department, the US Department of Agriculture and also the Department of Energy show the co-development of land with agriculture actually increases the productivity when we bring in solar relative to the productivity of the land itself. It's called agrivoltaics. And what they're actually seeing is increased populations of the bees and therefore increased pollinization and increased productivity. 1973 Land Conservation Development Act, very progressive at the time, but in some ways it does create barriers to development of new renewable energy projects. Limited utility company competition or collaboration, each little utility company is either in their, their little sector and they're very protected. So there isn't collaboration, even though the Public Utility Commission does encourage them to do, the reality is it doesn't happen. Let's take a look at a path forward. Well. To complete an Oregon Renewable Energy Transmission Study, although we've spent significant time doing this study, we would actually recommend the state of Oregon, like states like Maine and states like New Mexico, do an independent survey to go back and quantify the, the exact amount of renewable energy resources and where would be the optimum area for energy storage and also future development of power transmission. Second of all, Streamline that permitting processes. That is absolutely essential. Initiate renewable energy tenders. The states have been doing this for offshore, but states like Maine in last year held a renewable energy tender, although they have a renewable energy standard of being 100% by 2045, the governor wants to make steady progressive progress to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So last year they held a tender and had 500 megawatts of uh, bids that were awarded to onshore wind, solar uh, projects that can help them accelerate the move and tie into the grid to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We could easily be holding 500 to 1,000 megawatts of tenders per year. Provide tax credits for renewable energy projects, particularly for new technology that hasn't had infrastructure like offshore wind. Uh, and attract uh, investment capital. If we want to really see development of renewable energy in our state, we have to recognize we need to attract that investment capital to make it happen. And encourage the development of local companies, wind farms, solar projects, geothermal projects. This could be a real energy hub for development of new resources, not only for Oregon, but for other states and in our nation. Expand the intertie transmission line capacity to increase the ability to transmit and sail power down to California, which will increase the security of the grid for the, the West Coast. Finally, develop a world-class renewable energy apprenticeship program. There are shortages, dramatic shortages of trained people to operate and run wind farms, solar projects, and renewable energy projects. These are well-paying good jobs, but they don't have to be university degrees. In fact, they seldom are. But apprenticeship programs have proven to be highly successful uh, in Europe, and they can be easily transmit, uh, copied and replicated here, and we could be a leader of that in the United States. So in the conclusion, the question is, it isn't, Oregon's potential, because our potential of renewable energy is vast. The question is, how do we unlock this potential? Reduce greenhouse gas emissions, develop new clean energy industry in the state of Oregon, develop a world-class renewable energy apprenticeship programs, and finally create over 33,000 permanent high paying renewable jobs just in the facilities themselves, and over 1 million construction jobs building new clean, green energy projects in the state of Oregon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack, for putting in the time to develop this presentation. 
uh, a lot of things to think about there. And we'd like to thank uh, our listeners for spending the time to listen to us. And we'll send you information on our, our organization and contact information uh, for later discussions. Thank you. Thank you.